Hi, this is Kevin Shanahan in for Magnet Sociology. This is Chapter 11, Gender, Age, and Health. We'll first start out talking about a brief case study, uh, and then we'll move into the section on gender, then age and disability, and then health. Although generalizations can lead to problems, understanding the differences between gender-based Communication styles can lead to healthier relationship. Sociolinguist Deborah Tannen likens the difference to communication across cultures. The differences are instilled in children as they play. The focus on the different goals for the same conversation can lead to stress. Men and women's different communication styles occasionally can lead to conflict. Understanding these differences can make social interaction more pleasant. Tannen found that uh, both men and women communicate in different ways, and this leads to much of the conflict that happens in relationships. Section one, gender. The specific behaviors and attitudes that a society establishes for women and uh, men and women are called gender roles. Individuals can learn appropriate gender role behavior through socialization. Gender roles are both different and unequal. In general, to be female is to be in a position of lesser power in society. Women have worked hard to overcome inequality in education, work, and politics. Main idea is that individuals learn appropriate gender behavior through socialization in many societies. Gender roles lead to social inequality. So our questions that we want to answer for this section are how gender roles in identity are formed and how, gender, how does gender play into social inequality in the United States? Gender is the behavior and psychological traits considered appropriate for men and women. Gender roles are the specific behaviors by society for men and women. And gender identity is the awareness of being masculine or feminine as defined by society. Margaret Mead studied expectations across three cultures and found differences. Differences are seen as proof that gender is social, not biological. Gender identity and socialization. Babies are given different toys. The boys are given trucks. The girls are given dolls, for instance. Expected behavior, interests, and strengths are different for young boys and girls. Expectations are learned early. Gender roles and social inequality. In most societies, gender is the primary factor used to determine a person's social standing. Sociologists ask why this is. One widely held view is that gender inequality is related to human reproduction. Over time, the patriarchy, a system of which men are dominant over women, arose. The conflict perspective suggests that male control of economic and political spheres have reinforced their dominant position. The idea of institutionalized discrimination is sometimes given as reason for inequality. Sexism is the belief that one sex is by nature superior to the other. Sexism becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. All right, what I'd like you to do in order to study this is to do this assignment on gender in advertising. During adulthood, mass media play an important role in gender socialization. Advertising is a medium that most Americans confront on a daily basis. How do advertisements in various publications represent and reinforce established gender roles in society? Our procedure will be you're going to look at a variety of magazines and the advertisements. Make sure that you have the magazines directed at male, female, and gender neutral audiences. You may look at internet ads if you cannot access any magazines. Choose 10 advertisements to examine in detail these ads. They should represent a range of product and audiences. Analyze the ads for their portrayal of gender roles. Which products are geared toward each gender? 
do advertisers use different techniques to sell their products to men as opposed to women? Record your observations. Then, to analyze this, you'll compare the advertisements that you selected with the ones chosen by your classmates. Discuss your observations. How do the advertisements represent traditional American gender roles? Are certain roles more commonly addressed than others? Do you think that advertising helps to perpetuate or prolong the existence of specific gender roles? If so, are the possible consequences of this situation? See, how have gender roles changed over time? Roles are less restrictive for women who are more strongly encouraged now to have careers and other roles outside the home. Gender inequality in the United States. The women's movement. Officially, it began in 1848 when women demanded suffrage, which is the right to vote. Uh, they used civil disobedience. Uh, it eventually kind of went by the wayside during the uh, period where they tried to abolish slavery, and then it resurfaced uh, later yeah, after the Civil War uh, it, to get the right to vote, and then it kind of went down a little bit uh, after they got, women got the right to vote, and it resurfaced in the 1970s as women started to become dominant in uh, the workforce, or not dominant, but more prominent. Uh, education. Since 1979, more women than men have been going to college. Women focus on education and the hum and humanities. Uh, humanities are fields like uh, social studies, English, um, philosophy, things like that. Uh, while men focus on engineering and the professions. So they're going to go into the areas of being doctors and... Uh, architects and engineer type positions. The wage gap, the level of women's income is relative to that of men. Okay, so women tend to get paid less than men do. There is a thing known as the glass ceiling. This is an invisible barrier that prevents women from gaining upper level positions. There's an idea that a woman can't be president. And a few years ago, in 2016, when Hillary Clinton won the nomination, she became the first woman uh, to run for president in one of the major political parties. And they made a big deal about her breaking the glass ceiling. However, she did not win that election, which shows that women have yet to break through that layer of the glass ceiling uh, most women have to uh, eventually work at what is known as the second shift. What you see is women go to work all day, they work hard, they do their 40 hours a week or, what, or more, and then they come home and typically the woman is the dominant caregiver in the house. She cleans the house, she tends to take care of the children and things like that. The men do less of those kind of chores and as a result, uh, this is often referred to as the second shift for, for women. Uh, in politics, women make up about 52% of the voting age people, but only 16 and 24% of the elected offices. So though they are about 52% of the electorate, they aren't even a quarter of the population serving in elective office. Some women have been appointed to high office, however. Uh, after many years of fighting for gender equality, women have made great strides in their struggle to be given the same treatment and opportunities as men. How has this woman's movement achieved these gains? Well, as early as 1848, uh, Elizabeth Cady State Stanton and Lucretia Mott organized the first Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York, the attendees approved the Declaration of Sentiments, a document detailing social injustice towards women. And it was largely based on the uh, Declaration of Independence, by the way. Uh, in 1920, with the adoption of the 19th Amendment, suffragists finally succeeded in gaining women the right to vote. So here, uh, 80 years later, 
before women actually got the right to vote. In 1941, when the United States entered World War II, millions of women joined the labor force to fill jobs vacated by male soldiers. Women also found new roles in the military, joining special divisions of the Army and Navy. Uh, in 1963, Betty Friedan published the book called The Feminine Mystique. This was a criticism of the limits society placed on women, which galvanized the women's movement. In 1964, the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibited discrimination based on gender, gender created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC. In 1966, Friedan and a group of women formed an organization known as the National Organization for Women, known as NOW, to pursue the goals of the women's movement, including equal pay for equal work, child care for working mothers, and abortion rights. In 1972, Congress passed the Equal Rights Amendment, the uh, the ERA, which would guarantee men and women the same rights and protections under the law. The amendment was never ratified. They never reached the level of two-thirds of the states, uh, making it a part of their state constitutions. Uh, today, the gender gap in achievement and pay continues to shrink gradually. More women are elected to political office than they have been in the past. Statistically speaking, the gender cap prior to 1979, men outnumbered women on college campuses across the country. Since then, however, women have made great strides in narrowing the gender gap and the number of advanced degrees awarded. So examine the chart above, which field experienced the biggest challenge changes between 1980 and 2005? Five. All right, so let's go back and check on what we've talked about so far. How do these gender roles affect the opportunities available to men and women in American society? Often gender roles influence the types of careers men and women pursue or dictate which jobs they will get or how far they will go in their careers. A glass ceiling still limits women in male-dominated fields, while similar restrictions do not seem to hinder men in female-dominated professions. Age and dis Section 2, Age and Disability. While age discrimination still exists, many Americans are attempting to change the stereotypical image of people age 65 and older. The populations of the United States and the world are aging. Elderly Americans have become both a political force and a topic of debate. Many people with disabilities, some of whom are also elderly, face discrimination and prejudice in addition to dealing with their health problems. So the main idea of this unit is as society ages, the concerns of the elderly take on increasing importance. Many elderly people have disabilities, as do many other Americans. What is ageism is uh, uh, one of the things that we want to be able to answer at the end of this section. What are the population trends of the aging world? And how do politics of aging affect elderly Americans? What issues do Americans with disabilities face? In pre-industrialized societies, ageism, uh, in pre-industrialized societies, rank rose with age. So the older you were, the more prestigious you became. In industrialized societies, however, middle-aged have the greatest social power. Ageism is the belief that one age category is by nature superior to another age category. So in industrialized societies, those that are middle-aged look down on the older people as, you know, having gone past their prime and look down at younger people as not quite being qualified yet because they don't have the experience. The stereotype of the elderly is unproductive, cranky, and physically or mentally impaired, 
But in reality, most people over 65 are self-sufficient, active members of our society. Media uses youth to sell products and focuses on negative aspects of aging. In the United States, uh, a youth culture is what our society is all about. So how can ageism be seen in American society? In TV commercials, they have older people selling products such as denture prep, burial plans, medications, or news, which focuses on the negative aspects of aging, such as poverty and poor health. People don't typically talk about how um, people who are older tend to have uh, more uh, uh, active lifestyles as far as the freedom of being able to travel and things like that. Uh, Today, there are 705 million people aged 60 and older worldwide. Japan has the oldest population in the world, while Uganda has the youngest. The median ages are increasing across the globe. Aging in the United States, we refer to this as the graying of America, is the phenomenon of an increasing percentage of Americans being 65 or older. The causes of this are advances in health care. People don't die off in their 40s and 50s as much as they used to. The baby boom generation is the largest age group in the United States and is reaching the age of 65 and older. Uh, and that's where, you know, the expression, there's a, the new expression now is how the baby boomers are blaming the younger generations for everything, and they have that expression, okay, boomer, of course. Uh, so what are the two primary reasons for the graying of America? People live longer because health care and living conditions have improved. The huge baby boom generation is aging, and as they age, they become uh, more concerned with and conservative with time. Um, Around the world, populations are aging across the globe. The United States, the percentage of people aged 65 and older tripled in the 1900s. Which world region has the youngest population and which region has the oldest? What do you think the consequences will be for these regions? The politics of aging, as a number of senior citizens increase their images changed to one powerful voting block, the AARP, the National Social, excuse me, the National Council of Senior Citizens, the National Council on Aging, and a group known as the Gray Panthers are groups that bring attention to the needs of aging. AARP is the largest special interest group in the United States. Challenges to government. One major concern is the Social Security system. As baby boomers retire, the dependency ratio, the number of workers for each person receiving Social Security decreases. Social Security is funded by uh, payroll, which uh, everybody contributes to their Social Security. So the generations that are putting in now are paying for the retirement of the people who have been receiving Social Security in the, uh, who are on Social Security now. Uh, So when the number of people receiving these benefits is increasing as the baby boomers retire and reach the age of 65, and they are receiving benefits for a longer period of time due to their longer life expectancies. Originally, when people started receiving Uh, Social Security, they were only expected to live to 70 or 75 years old. Uh, So retiring at 65, you would only get your Social Security for five or maybe 10 years. Now people are living typically 75 to 80, 90 years old. So it's gone. So instead of it being five to 10 years, on average, it's become five or it, it's become 10 to, to 20 years on average. Uh, Medicare and health insurance for the elderly and, uh, and Medicaid is health for insurance for low income are the sole source of insurance for about one-fourth of elderly Americans. 
age inequality in the United States. Although the elderly are in general better off than other groups, certain, certain segments of the elderly, such as African Americans and women, have a higher rate of poverty in the general population. And this is due largely in the fact that their social security uh, is based on what they earn during their lifetime. And historically, African Americans and women make less than the typical white male. What are major political issues that concern the elderly people? Possible answers would be the funding of the Social, Secure, Social Security system, the rising costs in the health care system, especially the uh, Medicare system, the availability of it, and Medicaid are issues linked to poverty. Americans with disability. The term disability covers a variety of conditions, including physical disabilities, chronic health impairments, mental retardation, mental illness, and visual hearing or speech impairments. Prejudice and discrimination. One stereotype is that people with disabilities cannot do productive work. Many cannot find jobs and those that do earn less. Government policies aim to fix this problem. The Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA of 1990, has perhaps brought the most sweeping changes. The ADA makes discrimination against people with disabilities illegal. Passed in 1990, the American Disability Act addresses four main areas in the lives of people with disabilities. The ADA makes it illegal to discriminate against people with disabilities in hiring, promotion, and pay. It also requires companies to provide job training and aids such as interpreters to improve opportunities. Public services. The ADA also makes it illegal to, uh, to deny Americans with disabilities the uh, benefit of public services, including transportation. All public buses and trains have to be made accessible to people with disabilities. And that's why you see so many of the buses now have the lift steps and things like that. Um, uh, hotels, restaurants, and theaters, and other businesses that serve the public must make their facilities accessible to people with disabilities. And this is why you see many different uh, uh, buildings have wheelchair ramps now. Uh, telecommunications, telephone companies provide telecommunication relay services, uh, which allow text telephones used by hearing impaired or speech impaired communication with regular telephones. So what uh, efforts have been made to guarantee civil rights for Americans with disabilities? The Education for All Handicapped Children Act of 1975, the Fair Housing Amendment Act of 1988, and the Americans with Disability Act of 1990 all made conditions for uh, the disabled community to be more accessible. Finally, health in Section 3. Many Americans are concerned about three aspects of the national health care system. It's cost, their quality, and access. The United States has been discussing a national health care system since about 1910 and has been going on ever since. Uh, the, President Theodore Roosevelt was one of the first uh, to bring it up. Uh, health care costs are rising, but many Americans are concerned that the same health insurance plans allow them to pay their medical bills and may not provide the highest quality care. The distribution of physicians both geographically and within the medical profession affects Americans' access to health care. The health care system faces such issues as health insurance, inequality, and health alternative medicine. There are, uh, and the global challenges of AIDS. The main idea, Americans are concerned about the cost and quality of health care. Not all Americans have equal access to health care. The three main, so in this one, we need to talk about the three main concerns about health care in the United States and what are the major issues facing the American health care system today. 
Health care is a priority for Americans who worry about the cost and quality of the access to health care. The United States spends more on health care than any other country in the world. In, and in fact, the United States has some of the fastest rising health care costs in the world. Advances in medical care and increased cost of drugs account for most of this increase. Statistically, Speaking, health care spending, health care costs in the United States are climbing. Most Americans rely on insurance companies and the government to pay their medical expenses. Who is the largest provider of health care dollars? What service requires that largest portion of health care dollars? And what do you think that, why do you think that is the case? Quality of health care. Managed, managed care plans provide members with health care services in exchange for a monthly or annual charge. The plan limits costs by requiring members to use certain doctors. And to have certain treatments. Although managed care plans have reduced the cost of care, many Americans feel that managed care has reduced the quality of care. A patient's Bill of Rights has been introduced in Congress several times, but has never been passed. Access to health care. Studies show a surplus of doctors. Most doctors are concentrated in wealthy, urban, and suburban areas. In poor, inner city, and rural areas, there are fewer doctors, but more people need, need of care. These underserved areas usually have a greater number of people with chronic diseases, and many elderly people. There are more specialists than there are general practitioners. Technology, smaller than small. The nanotechnology, it's the application of research conducted on the nanoscale, which ranges roughly from one to 100 nanometers. A nanometer is defined as one billionth of a meter. A sheet of paper is about 100,000 nanometers thick. So when things get that small, they begin to exhibit new behaviors and properties. By working at the nanoscale and the molecular level, scientists can create new materials and get familiar ones to behave in new ways. After two decades of working with the nanoscale materials, scientists and engineers have begun to apply their knowledge. Nanotechnology is already used to make sunscreen transparent, to make clothing stain resistant, and to make tennis balls last longer. It has also been applied to the world of medicine. New antibacterial wound dressings such as use nanotechnology. Researchers are using nanotechnology to improve the usefulness of biochips like the one shown in the photo of this page. These biochips can test human proteins for infectious dis diseases in less than 15 minutes. Current research in nanomedicine is focused on finding new ways to diagnose and treat disease. Supporters of nanomedicine argue that earlier detection and more effective treatments will cause healthcare costs to decline. Others, however, wonder if the nanomedicine will be another expensive therapy that only certain people can afford. Researchers in nanotechnology recognize their product will need to be affordable in order to be the most useful. So, what do you think the ethical issues might nanomedicine bring up? Finally, let's discuss uh, what we've learned so far about medicine. What trends cause Americans to be concerned about the cost and quality and access to health care? The rising costs, the inability of many to afford and get approval for insurance, options limited by cost control measures of managed care plans, and a shortage of doctors in some areas. Healthcare issues today. 84% of medical costs are covered by insurance. The kinds of procedures treatments covered differ private and public insurance plans. Some argue for a certain centrally planned national health care system 
poor people are more likely to receive inadequate care because of the current health care system. People who live in poverty and have higher rate and of health issues uh, tend not to uh, be well served for their lack of ability to pay. Uh, these people typically lack insurance as well. Most ins health insurance is uh, through your employer, and many of these types of jobs uh, do, that these people work in, they do not have uh, adequate health insurance. Um, alternative medicine. Alternative medicine uses unconventional methods such as acupuncture, acupressure, or herbal remedies. Alternative methods have little regulation, uh, lots of vitamins and things like that, and uh, there is no uh, testing or standards necessarily applied in those areas. So those drugs are oftentimes, medications are, well, those, yeah, medications are not uh, as well regulated as, uh, over the, uh, as prescribed medicines. And then finally, we talk about AIDS, the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. AIDS attacks the immune system. No cure has been found, though they've made tremendous gains in research on the treatment for AIDS. No, um, new drugs seem to slow the disease, and some people seem to uh, have been in remission. And in, uh, there are a few cases of people who have actually been cured or have recovered from AIDS and no longer have the symptoms. Um, statistically speaking, when it comes to uninsured Americans, the cost of health care varies by state, which affects how many people can purchase health insurance. Um, now, remember, this chart is out of date because of the fact that uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Obamacare plan that was passed, or whatever they call it now, the National Health Care Plan, uh, um, it has changed the uh, uh, rate of people who are uninsured now. Um, the estimated number of people living with AIDS, an estimated 33 million people around the world are living with HIV AIDS. Of those, two and a half million are children under the age of 15. So what percentage of people living with HIV AIDS reside in Sub-Saharan Africa? So how are these four issues affecting the American health care system? Health insurance access issues become, because not all employers cover it, companies often can reject people for pre-existing conditions. That's no longer legal, but it was a problem. Inequality, lack of insurance for some, a shortage of doctors in poor and rural areas, and alternative medicine are all factors that affect the healthcare system. Um, Alternative medicine is not scientifically tested, often not covered by insurance. Uh, AIDS is a, a number of people infected of the strain on the system. And so far, there's been no proof that, the, there, or that there is a cure, and it is oftentimes a fatal disease. Um, so here's our experiment for this chapter. Um, we're going to test the gender ages, or test gender differences. Are men and women really that different from each other? In this lab, you'll explore the differences between men and women. You're going to work in a small group to review the process of creating an experiment and brainstorm a list of differences. The first thing you're going to do is form a hypothesis and present it to the class. The second thing, you're going to review the research process. As a group, review the seven-step process of designing an experiment. Look back at chapter one for a detailed explanation if you uh, don't remember. All right, so the first steps here are define the problem. 
Uh, the researcher selects a topic for study and develops operational definitions of key concepts. The re step two is you're going to review the literature. You're going to look through uh, the various websites and um, uh, professional periodicals. The researcher reviews an existing literature on the topic. You're going to form a hypothesis in which you're going to develop a testable hypothesis on the research topic. In step four, you're going to choose a research design. Here, the researcher develops a plan for collecting and analyzing and evaluating data. Then you're in step five, you're going to collect the data. The researcher gathers and carefully records data. Step six, analyze the data. The researcher objectively analyzes the data to determine whether the data support the research hypothesis. And in step seven, uh, you'll present your conclusions. The researcher presents the research finding to other sociologists. In our case, that would be to the class. Uh, so our we will create uh, discuss gender differences by creating a list of differences in social characteristics of men and women. We're going to decide what stereotypes there are of men and women and in what ways might men and women be different and how do we measure these differences. So design your, your experiment. You're going to form your hypothesis, determine what kind of data you will need to determine this information, design an experiment to gather this data, uh, consider what results you expect, and what conclusions can you draw about human behavior based on what you think you will find. Then you're going to present your experiment, your group's experiment with the class. What concerns do your classmates have with your experiment? How would your classmates have improved the experiment? Can your classmates replicate your experiment? Meaning if you did it, um, Another group should be able to do the experiment the same using your techniques and your methods and come up with a similar result. Unlike uh, science, uh, a social science, oftentimes you come up with similar results, but not exactly the same because of variations in the, number, the people that you interview. However, you should find uh, a comparable result within a few percentages. Uh, Use your classmates' comments to revise and improve your experiments, and then prepare a written description for your teacher. What did you learn from this lab? As a group, discuss the following. How successful was the class at designing experiments? What did the best experiments have in common? And what were co some common weaknesses in the experiments? Why do stereotypes persist? And would your data have been different if your experiment were performed in a different country? And that completes our unit on uh, your, our Chapter 11 uh, Gender, Age, and Health unit. Uh, and this is our completion of Unit 3. Thank you.